This is Marjan Love, and this is Marjan's Musings, and today's show is Bobbin Lace Exploration. When Kevin and I were in Amsterdam, we went to the Rijk Museum, and there was a beautiful oil painting done by Vermeer of the lace maker. I got to talking at lunch with Kevin about memories I started having of being a very little girl, I mean like four, and having my grandma show me my great-grandmother's behest to me. My great-grandmother had passed away, and she left me her lace-making table her bobbins, her thread, and her other tools, and my grandmother began to teach me how to make bobbin lace. And my husband said, well, you know, if you wanted to take it up again, why don't you try it? And so I went online looking for lace makers, handmade lace makers. And I found little shops that supply the specialized tools of the trade. Now, the lace industry started out as a way for peasants who were fisher folk to take the skill of making fishing nets and scale it down from cord that you used, sturdy, heavy cord to catch slippery live fish, to finer thread to reinforce the edges of sleeves and collars because in those days, textiles were made at home or at least in the village and they were loomed, you know, and Every piece of fabric was cut to the dimensions you needed. There wasn't a lot left over for hems. And so the earliest laces were used to reinforce cuffs and collars so that they would not fray. And you didn't have to waste fabric making a hem. Over time, Lace making got much more refined and it spread throughout the early 1400s and 1500s. I found an interesting book, Living with Lace, by Bunnell, I think she says her name, and in it she has a history of lace making. I found some of it really kind of sad um, that the conditions for the lace makers were so poor and that young girls in an era before birth control were given away to convents when families had so many children that the harvest couldn't feed them all. And so in Catholic countries and also in Protestant countries, young girls wound up living in what we think of today as a boarding school, but you didn't learn a whole lot in the boarding school. And the conditions were somewhere between a school and uh, a labor camp. And these little girls, as young as five, would be taught how to make lace. 
This book is mostly about how to use lace as an interior decorating motif, like how do you use lace on your beach umbrella to make your picnic on the beach, you know, very special and whatever. But there are many, many books on lace. And when I started to get serious about trying it, I got a hold of a woman named Holly Van Skyver, and she recommended a book to me, Introduction to Bobbin Lace in color because as a beginner if you work with all white thread you can get very confused so we're going to do a little show and tell today i've got here my very first bobbin lace braids they're called this one is the first sample and what you learn is the different ground stitches and then this one here is the very first edging. And it's one of the first braids connected to one of the first ground stitches. So I'm going to show you my bobbins so that I can talk to you about some of the fun that I've had and some of the intriguing things I've found out. These bobbins are called gotambo. These light colored bobbins are wound right now with forest green linen. I thought these were beautiful. These are rosewood and they're wrapped in white linen. And depending on the type of wood that your bobbins are made out of, they're, they range in expense. The Gatambo, or the maple ones that are simple, these are bayou bobbins, this teardrop shape. And the different names of the bobbins correspond to different areas of the world. Like I have a dainty little bobbin, and I thought it was called Binchy. It's B-I-N-C-H-E. But I was correct, you know, it's Bonche. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay, it's Bonche. I, I found since the um, art of lace making has been around since the 1400s, uh, there's a lot of kind of cliqueiness the which group is making what lace and which lace is the best lace. <laughs> it's like which bobbins are the preferred bobbins. And I got in this whole thing about pins. Like what? There's this book um, by Brunona. I thought that was a fascinating first name, Brunona, and uh, it's called The Lace Reader, and it's set in Salem, which was kind of fun because everything she talks about, you've seen, like the witch house and all that stuff, but The Lace Reader is uh, a fortune teller, and she's teaching other people how to hold up lace, like a big panel of lace, and read the lace. It was kind of like, I don't know if that actually existed or not, but they were talking about Ipswich lace, and Ipswich lace actually does exist. So it was kind of interesting. The story's interesting, too. I don't want to do any spoilers, but right near the end, you're like, oh my goodness, <laughs> like all your presumptions go out the window. Anyway, the pins. So I bought French pins that are called accoutrement. And they're long, thin, stainless steel pins. They were a little expensive. So I went to uh, Cracker Jacks and I bought Driz silk pins. And then I bought... Driz satin pins and both of them together were less expensive than those accoutrement. And then they get you to buy 
glass head pins that come in colors and that worked out great for me because you have to read a pattern and the patterns are in the book. They show you how to make up your pattern. So I brought in all the goodies and I'm going to try to show you today how to make a little pattern. In modern times, you use a heavy blue cardstock, but in historic times, they used parchment, and many of those parchments are still in existence. I went ahead and drew out two spiders in advance so that I, you wouldn't be sitting there watching me drawing dots on the page. But what you have to do is cut your parchment. And I have better scissors for this at home, but I could only bring so many things. My car was about bursting at the seams as it was. And then you cut out your parchment to the size of your little pattern and you make what's called a pricking. And then you put a low gloss blue contact paper on top of the pricking. When I first started, I used packing styrofoam because it was free. I had it. But once you get going, I think it's kind of nice to try the actual tools of the trade. So I have these two spiders here and each one has a different number of legs. And what you do is you pin it down and these great big pins are called Le Coron d'Or, which means, I think, the crown of gold. And I'm not sure why that's there. And then if you push a lot of pins into a board, you can really get a bruise on your thumb. So they sell a, a little wooden tool that's metal with a hollow end and you press the pins in with the hollow end to preserve your skin. And then you pin it down temporarily into a cork board. The cork board is kind of thin, so you've got to be careful when you do the pricking. And then there's an interesting thing. You purchase a pin vise. What it is, is a wooden handle that has a divided metal tang that's threaded, and then a nut goes on the outside that brings that divided thread together. And then depending on what size thread you're using and what size graph paper you're using, that determines what size needle goes into the, the pin vise, the needle vise. And you tighten it down really hard. And I have a bit of arthritis, so I got one with a big flat head that's easy to hold and push down on. You peel the blue contact paper and stick it on there. And what you do is you poke a hole everywhere you've made a dot on the graph paper. And when you're done making those holes in the graph paper, you have your design that you work from. And this is a pricking. It has all the holes already punched in it and the inked dots so you can see them from the front and the smooth contact paper. This side is rough. That got me thinking about a conversation I had with my grandmother.
about how rich people wanted lace, beautiful lace for their collars and cuffs. And at the time, men wore a great deal of lace in the courts of Louis the Fourteenth and whatever. And the young women and girls who made the lace lived in very poor conditions. And there was stuff like the soot from the fireplace will damage the lace so the girls making lace weren't allowed to sit near the fire to keep warm in the winter. Some of it was like, ah, made me aggravated. Anyway, as I started exploring the different bobbins, I found out that there's a big price differential. These bobbins are about, I don't know, $15 for 10. These bobbins that are made out of the rosewood are about $25 per 10. And the ones that I only have the two of are $15 dollars per 10. These are ebony. And that's what my great grandmother's bobbins were. And the reason that lace makers like the ebony bobbins is they're heavy and they help you tension the lace. Holly Van Skyver sold me Lisbeth cotton to start out with. And I learned on YouTube, on a video, that from one set of fingertips to the other set of fingertips is about a yard or a meter. Everybody's a little different, but it's about a yard. And when you first start out, you wind your bobbins by hand. So you take a tail, push it down with your thumb, and then wrap away from yourself. But then you spin the bobbin rather than wrapping because there's either an S twist or a Z twist on the thread. Most thread is plied. It's made out of more than one strand. And so you spin that bobbin to fill it with the thread. And as you can see, it's kind of a tedious kind of a process. You're sitting there going, oh, okay, how am I spinning this thread so long? And I was like, isn't it just easier to wind it? Like you could wind it. Oh, that, that, that's pretty quick. You can get a lot done that way. And they're like, no, Roll your thread on so you don't untwist the thread and have it look all frayed and used. And then there's a special little knot that took me a while to figure out. You, when you get the thread back up near the top, and I bought a split top bobbin. I was told, you know, this is a good bobbin for beginners. You wrap the thread around your finger, twist it either once or twice. I found for me twice worked better. Put it over the neck of the bobbin and pull it taut and then it won't come off. Bobbins in lace work are used in pairs especially in the beginning, but throughout your lace work, most of the time, unless you're doing great big continental pieces, this woman by the name of Jill, who's in the New England Lace Guild, she is working on a tablecloth made out of dozens and dozens of squares of lace. This is a project that's taking her years. I'm cheating because of time constraints on the show because I wanted to show you the basic stitches because it's deceptively simple lace making.
It's sort of in a way kind of like chess, but even simpler than chess. So here, you stick your finger up through the thread, twist it around twice, and put it over the neck of the bobbin and pull it snug. I've got three pairs of bobbins here. This is pair one, pair two, pair three. That's the simplest braid that'll stay together. So this is one, two, three, four, and these you don't use right away. You put them aside because you only work with two sets of bobbins at a time. So the first motion is a cross. One always crosses toward the right with the second bobbin two over three and the second motion is a twist I'll do it again okay because that's the only two motions that there are and you think oh my goodness all these intricate laces and that's the only motions there are that's it there's a cross and a twist and the basic stitches are comprised of cross twist, cross twist, and then you pull up to tension. Now, you leave this pair of bobbins on the side. That's now abandoned, or uh, as the Spanish people say, abandonné. And then, this has a twist in it. I'm going to put a twist in that one. Cross, twist, cross, twist, and you pull up in tension. That's the basic motions that you use. This bolster was an interesting experiment. You make the pillow slip for it, and my Kevin took a big rubber mallet and sawdust and pounded it into this pillow in what was like several cups and then smash it down to an inch and then several more cups of sawdust and smash it down to another inch and several more cups of sawdust. It's a long process. And you're supposed to put a hem on one end and a hem on the other end. And when you get done, you pull the cord really tight after you put a cardboard or a wood to hold the sawdust in. We had a box of sawdust like this from Ace Hardware from the lumber yard. And um, <laughs> that's as big as it is. This whole box of sawdust is this thing. But it weighs 10 pounds. I'm like, oh my goodness. And this beautiful lace was made by someone much more talented than I am. But this is a bolster pillow so that you can work in yardage. You put your pattern on it and you turn the bolster, turn the bolster, and you have an uptake reel and you take up what you've done and wind it on your uptake reel and you can just repeat repeat and do yards and yards and when you think some of these intricate laces with the leaves and flowers are like even a good lace maker can take an hour to make an inch of lace i brought in something I saw on the internet which I thought was an interesting thing. These are just pop beads. They're inexpensive pop beads. And what they help you do is you pin them on your bolster and they help you keep your bobbins in order. Now with six bobbins that's no big deal. 
But by the time you get up to like a hundred and some bobbins so that you've got like 50 pairs of bobbins, it's really nice to be able to have the bobbins stay where you put them. And so the beads are kind of interesting and then they put a little strip of um, ribbon on top to hold them so that when you transport the pillow, the uh, bobbins don't wind up all tangled, which can be a nightmare. So I showed you my very first braid and my first edging. And then I got a little fancier. The wisdom is if you go to all the trouble to make a pricking, you should use it more than once. And so I made this bookmark motif twice, once with green and once with navy blue as the edging. And when I first looked at it, I thought, oh my goodness. It starts out A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, and you put in your temporary big glass head pins, and then the pattern tells you how many pairs of bobbins that you need, and then you go down the other side, and it's J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, and you put those pins and those pairs of bobbins. And then there's a drawing that has a zigzag and it says start at one, go to two, go to three, go to four, and in between you're doing your cloth stitch. <laughs> Well, they got all the way up to 90. You know, each little thing goes. Up. And then suddenly you're out of numbers. And if you haven't figured it out by then, tough luck. I was like, okay. <laughs> and uh, I brought in my, my nemesis. This is a cookie pillow. It's made out of... Uh, Ethafoam and it has a cover. It's very lightweight. I love this thing. Um, and I was going to Sturbridge Village to the Makers Festival to see lace makers in action. I felt like, you know, I'm sitting by myself at the house and sometimes I tried things like this is half stitch. And it's in blue, white, and green. And the white was supposed to line back up, and it didn't, and I didn't know why. So I actually needed a teacher. I needed somebody to say, hey, dummy, you, you didn't do this, or you should have done that, or next time do such and such, which I think would have been the best approach for me. And so I went out to ye old Sturbridge Village, to the Makers Festival, I got to see lace makers, some of them working on the bolster, some of them working on a cookie, and some of them working in a travel pack. I thought, oh, when I get some extra uh, cash, I'm gonna get myself one of those. But I brought this in to show you. This was the one where my skills fell apart. I made it twice and neither one is very good. So I'm going to Ithaca, New York, and I'm going to do uh, what's called Lace Day. It's um, sponsored by the Finger Lakes Lace Guild. I'm gonna arrive there on Friday. There's like a reception. And then Saturday, there's sort of like a bazaar where people show gorgeous pieces of lace that they either made or bought or inherited. And also vendors are there, like Holly Van Skyver, who um, sells the lace making equipment. And as I told you last time, I've been having trouble with my vision. And my grandmother said that the little girls in the convents 
would have to work from six in the morning until eight at night. And in the winter, when it was dark in the morning, or at night after the sun went down, they'd put one candle in a stand and they have these outriggers with glass, blown glass globes filled with water. And that one candle would serve as many as six girls. And the globe would focus that one candlelight on their pillow. And my grandma told me that some of the young women went blind. And then how would they survive? How would they make any money? And so the other women would make them the prickings and they would use large, heavy pins like these coron d'or thick pins, and the women would make the lace by touch. They'd feel the pattern and make the knots by rote because they couldn't see them. And they're not actually knots, they're stitches. Tele, they say in Spanish. I've been watching Spanish people doing instruction videos and French people. There's a few people speaking English doing lace, but some of the really interesting techniques like tombolo uh, were in Spanish. But I got to thinking about all these little dots and how you felt them with your fingers to make the lace. And I wondered if that was the origin of Braille. I'm not sure. I need to do some research on that and find out. Anyway, because my vision is none too good lately, and with the diabetes, it's apt to get worse instead of better, at the lace days, I'm going to take Annex Day's silk scarf making workshop. And she has you buy, it's somewhere between thread and yarn. It's called Frisia, and it's made of silk. So I'm going to try that. This one is a variegated. At the uh, lace days at Sturbridge Village, I met this lovely lady by the name of Nancy who showed me, as a matter of fact, she made this for me, my bobbins when I try to transport them. These are from Holly Van Skyver. These are pear wood. They're beautiful. But when I got there, they were all tangled up. And she's like, no, 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 you can't transport them like that. And so she crocheted me a bobbin holder that holds your bobbins so that they don't get all tangled because believe me, the tangles can be like, oh my goodness, let's cut this thread off and start over. So I showed you the pin pusher. You know, you're going to push these pins in so you have this little tool. And I showed you the pattern pricker, the, pr the pin vise. Well, there's another tool that's kind of interesting. Have you ever broken your thumbnail trying to get a staple out of something? So they sell this handy dandy, you know, staple crowbar. Well, they have a similar thing for lace pins. If you want to take a lace pin out of your bolster without damaging your thumbnail. So I'm going to push this one all the way in. This is like a little fork with two tines. You slide it in underneath and you pry the pin up. It works great. So <laughs> I'm going out to Sturbridge Village. I've got this pattern that no matter what I did, I couldn't get it to come out right. I'm going to go see these lace makers and I don't want to look like a dork. You know, I don't want to look like the person that doesn't know what they're doing and can't 
you know, do their thing correctly. <laughs> so I decide I'm going to leave my pattern and my cloths in place. And I go over to Ace Hardware and I think, the heck with this $50 pillow thing. I'm going to get a kneeler pad for $12. <laughs> And I put my pattern down and I get out there and first off, my bobbins are like a spider web that somebody like kind of took a swat at. You know, they're like... And then you put the pins in and this is, I think, a plastic type of foam. And this one is a foam rubber. Well, after a couple of minutes, you can't get the pin out. The rubber like kind of anneals to the pin and the pins in there. And I have these glass head pins in the vise and I'm like trying to get them out and I'm popping the glass heads off the pins. I was like, steep learning curve. Did I tell you that there was a steep learning curve for this? So anyway, sometimes doing things on the cheap and like trying to cover your tracks doesn't work because everybody knew that I was basically an idiot and I didn't have a clue what I was doing. Anyway, so that thing I showed you about the winding the bobbins, there's this guy and he's in St. Peter Bucks and he makes a bobbin lace winder, which is great. You vise this thing onto your table and make sure it's kind of sturdy. It's made out of nylon, so it won't damage the expensive wooden bobbins. It can do two sizes of bobbins. It can do the longer bobbins, or it can do the little short bonge bobbins. And you put the little end in Slide the vise down so that it holds. Get your thread, and you need either a bowl or a plate, something smooth. I think a bowl is better. I didn't bring a bowl today. I brought a gorgeous plate that I found at the second glance by Edna Hibble. It's called Lovers of the Summer Palace. And it was so pretty. I showed it to my husband. I said, it made me think of when you and I were young. <laughs> and uh, my husband is getting kind of white of hair too. Not just me, but him as well. And he's like, I don't know that I was ever that young. And then the thread rolls on. It doesn't get untwisted because it rolls on the way they show you. But look at how quick this goes. This goes really quick. Finding a table with an edge thin enough to accommodate the, the seat clamp can be an issue. But this right now is just about, well, let's give it one more go. That's about a meter of thread. And what you do then is you'd stretch this out for the other meter of thread, take a second bobbin, take your first bobbin out, put the second bobbin in, tighten it down like you did the first one, put your thumb Hold the thread just like you're going to wind it by hand. Make a couple of wraps around to anchor it. And then you have a mechanical advantage of the little engine. And uh, <laughs> like I said, I, I'm a little, I have Scotch-Irish background. So I tend to try to do things inexpensively if I can. So I found this old hand drill at uh, second glance. <laughs> I got my friend Packy Fusco the plumber to help me set this drill up onto a metal stand and <laughs> it was a lot of like jerry rigging. 
Anyway, when I first got my bobbins, I had this memory of being four years old and my grandmother saying, okay, so when you have a pair of bobbins, they need to be even. They need to have the same amount of thread on each bobbin to start out. And she taught me how to roll the thread onto the bobbins. And before I invested in that uh, bobbin winder, it was interesting as I hand wound the bobbins, I could remember conversations between my auntie and my grandmother. Conversations that happened 61, 62 years ago. Entire conversations came back to me because of this motor skill of winding the bobbins. So these little banche bobbins, you know the ones I thought were called binchy, these make a different type of lace than the bayou bobbins. And these lovely little pearwoods that I got from Holly, um, I'm not sure, those are modern, they're new, so they don't have the same history to them. And then I took Nancy's idea and I crocheted up my own like holder for the bayou bobbins. And that may look like a lot of bobbins, but you're talking maybe an inch and a half, two inches of width that you're dealing with with that many bobbins because think of a loom. You have your warp threads and your weft threads. Well, on the bobbin lace, you have your warp threads are your passives and your weft threads are your workers. So that when you're going to make a piece of lace, you put about three times as much length as you want your finished project, but the width part, you have to put quite a bit extra because it goes back and forth, just like in a loom. It was kind of interesting. I'm learning a great deal about it, and hopefully for the next show, I'll be able to tell you fun stuff that I learned in New York. This is my big birthday present from my husband to be able to get to go to New York. But I wanted to show you a couple of more tools. I know you're all familiar with like a crochet hook, right? But for lace, the crochet hooks are tiny. 11, 12, 14. You look at them and you kind of need like a magnifying glass to see the little hook at the end. So I found this pretty quilted book cover. And I haven't started this yet. This is the Lace Guild. It's a Honiton lace patterns and it's flowers and different shapes using the basic stitches. And then I'm sure people have seen lace doilies. Those are Bucks Point lace. So those are my next two projects I'm going to do at my house. <laughs> But when you go to take a practical class, like where you're going to do something or you're going to make something, there's a materials list. <sighs> Guess how many bobbins I'm going to need to be able to make this scarf. Just take a wild stab. And the answer is 88 bobbins. <laughs> I'm like, you're kidding me, right? Like 88 bobbins? Well, at that point, I went online and I found this guy, Jan, who actually makes the bobbins. So I went straight to the source so that I could get them a little less expensive because 
If you can save $2 a bobbin on 88 bobbins, that's some substantial savings. So I thought that was kind of interesting. The other thing that was kind of weird for me was having to use a clear ruler and graph paper. I'm not that good <laughs> at keeping it straight. It's like, oh my goodness, I made a mistake and now I have to start over before I can put the little clear blue low glare contact paper on the pattern. And you learn things as you go. So this little lace edging that I have on my blouse took about four days of work to make this. And it's brilliant yellow and green and red so that I could see my mistakes, of which in the beginning I spent almost much time taking out as I did putting in. And then I thought, oh, this blue is so pretty. I love this blue. You could tell, you know, my cloths and my tablecloth and stuff are this blue. <laughs> it is very hard to see this blue against the blue contact paper. Live and learn. Anyway, when we went out, to the Sturbridge Village, my husband took me to the public house. And on the menu, it said, we have Thanksgiving every day. I was like, hmm, turkey, cranberry, sausage, cornbread stuffing, mashed potatoes, squash. I'm like, yeah, okay, I'm doing that. And I think he had steak tips. But if you're ever out at Sturbridge, the public house, oh my goodness, their turkey was as good as mine, maybe even a little better. So I said to the waiter, I said, so uh, Thanksgiving, you're coming to my house and you're going to bring all this? And he's like, mm, maybe not. <laughs> that was kind of fun. One of the people that I found was this lady. She, her thing is called Painted Lace Bobbins and her name is Allison P. Tolson, and I got my Bonge Bobbins from her, and she's in the UK, and the box was like Christmas. It was wrapped in this pretty striped paper with pretty stamps, and each little thing was in its own little wrapper, and... It was really nice. So if you decide you want to try lace, Holly's got everything at Van Skyver Bobbins. And um, Allison only has some things, not everything. But there's all kinds of stuff you can get into once you like pick up the hobby. And like I told you, it's sort of like chess. Those basic moves, Cross, twist. That's it. That's all there is. But is it twist, 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 cross, twist? Or is it cross, twist, twist, cross, twist, twist? And depending on how you do them, you can make beautiful pictures in the lace. Anyway, in the closing credits, I'm going to show you some of my wardrobe because I realized I love lace. Got all kinds of lace. Fortunately or unfortunately, that lace is machine-made lace. My grandmother told me that once the Jacquard people figured out how to make lace on a machine, Thousands of women lost their cottage industry. But she told me the Irish 
were inventive so that when tulle came out, which is like the netting that looks like rose ground, Irish ladies got into doing needle lace, which is a whole different kind of lace. Maybe we'll talk about that in the future if I get into that one. Anyway, today's show is Bob and Lace Adventures, and if you have a computer and you like Pinterest, I put a board up for you with dozens and dozens of pretty examples of Bob and Lace and some of needle lace or tatting, which is a whole different thing. Tatting uses a different shuttle. It's a little shuttle. It's not bobbins at all. Although you do wind the shuttle as if it was a bobbin. So go on Pinterest and look for Marjan Love and you get to see bobbin lace explorations. Do us here at 1623 Studios a favor. If you like the show, share the link with your friends on Facebook. Give us a thumbs up. Thanks.